you so much for joining us on this momentous occasion as we commemorate the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the letter from the Birmingham jail. We will have a selection from the Lawson State dance team coming up momentarily, and we will begin and proceed as the program is printed.
musical selection by the Lawson State Dance Team. Let's give them another round of applause. <laughs> now that we've had a tribute in dance, next up we will have a tribute in song. Ms. Diakonita Davison will now give that tribute for us.
change that we're here to celebrate this time. So here we go. Behind these rugged bars, I think of scars, etched into hearts of colored folk. Demanded to wait, not given a date, but now I and my people's patience broke. You question me why, it says, now's not the time. Professed our process should never be so. But while they content with facts ever been despised, so our patience broke. Reproached for our skin of which we're born with, had not say in our makeup, of course. As we patiently watched injustice prevail, we gave birth to impatience, because our patience broke. You gave us no choice, but silenced our voice through your government and yes, through your courts. Cases ignored because you wouldn't afford to give us such freedom, so our patience broke. We could, we could fight in your wars and lay down our lives, but unfit for the front of your bus. Given limited rights, if but for our lives, we scream in impatience because our patience broke. Be patient, they say, while we're hatreds pray, and poverty is our kinfolk. With bombs blasting off, bodies abused. We've been impatient, we've been patient, now our patience broke. Dare not speak up or stare out of eye with one deemed superior to you. One nation under God and one would think that I could stand right beside you. Brethren, our goal is not to overthrow, yet impatiently we scream to invoke the call of your conscience to fulfill this promise of which, year, of which for years has ever been choked. It's easy to criticize when you're not ostracized for being colored by birth, not by choice. So we stand to our feet when once on our knees, impatient because our patience broke. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Alexander. Next, we'll have an introduction of our esteemed panelists you see before us. To my left, far left, we have Dr. Samantha Briggs. One of the reasons we were interested in getting her to serve on the panel is she is actually devising the curriculum for the Civil Rights Institute. She is originally from St. Louis, Missouri, and has earned a doctoral degree in instructional leadership and a master's degree, master's degree in women's studies, and she served as an educational consultant in numerous capacities. Right next to her, we have Mr. James Robeson, who was instrumental in opening doors in the automobile industry for African Americans. Also, he serves as an educational consultant and is a longtime resident of Birmingham, Alabama, and a church member of Sixth Avenue Baptist Church, among with other civic responsibilities. Seated directly to my left, I don't know if you see any resemblance, but this is my father. Um, he is a longtime resident of Birmingham, Alabama. Not only is he my father, but he was the president of the SGA at Miles College in 1963, at the time that this letter was actually written. He was also instrumental in leading a student group into the Birmingham Public Library which he, they integrated the Birmingham Public Library. He's also the founder of the Birmingham Vulcan Co-Owners. To my right, we have two esteemed Lawson State students, Leandria Kennedy, and to my far right, is Tracy Odom, both of which are very scholarly individuals. We will proceed as the program is printed with a panel discussion, looking at the different aspects of the letter from the Birmingham jail, then and now. So please enjoy the program as it is printed. Good morning. Um, I'll be student number one, uh, and I get into reading the beginning of the letter. Um, dear fellow clergymen, while confined here in Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling my present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom do I pass. To answer, seldom do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all the criticisms that cross my desk, my secretaries would have little time for anything other than such correspondence in the course of the day. And I would have no time for constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine good, will and that your criticism is, are sincerely set for, I want to try to answer your statements in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. I think I should indicate why I'm here in Birmingham. Since you have been influenced by the view which argues against outsiders coming in, I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization operating in every southern state with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. 
We have some 85 affiliated organizations across the South. And one of them is the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Frequently we share staff, educational, and financial resources with our affiliates. Several months ago, the affiliate here in Birmingham asked us to be on call to engage in a nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. We readily consent, consented, and when the hour came, we lived the promise to our promise. So I, along with several members of my staff, am here because I was invited here. I am here because I have an organization, organizational ties here. But more basically, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the 8th century BC left their villages and carried their thus saith the Lord far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns, and just as the Apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco Roman world, so am I compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my own hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned with what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable in, in, in network of Mutality tie in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow, provincial, outside, agator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. Thank you, Simone. Thank you so much, Ms. Kennedy. Dr. King states he is in Birmingham because injustice is here. Many of you would still say injustice is here in some capacity and perhaps will always reside in these different cities. He goes to say that although he lives in Atlanta, he could not turn a blind eye to what was happening in Birmingham. He writes, anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. Today, there seems to be a lack of cooperation within the African American population. A kind of, I've got mine, you get yours mentality. What can those who have, meaning those who have education, a sense of financial security, and other perks, do to help those who are less fortunate? And I will ask one of my panelists to take on that question. Yes, Dr. I think the, the quick and easy answer to that would be to keep the education alive, to keep the stories going. Um, we do a disservice to ourselves and to future generations by remaining quiet. I had a grandmother who died uh, two years ago at 101, and she didn't begin to tell her story until she was 90. She said that as a proper Southern black woman, she needed to remain silent, and be demure and stay in her place. At 90, inhibitions were gone and she started running her mouth. But what she told us in those last 11 years, had she told us decades prior, I wonder where we would be today. Um, and I think that we have a responsibility when we have knowledge, when we have information, uh, we all have this veil of ignorance to some extent resting over our eyes. And we have the, the right, the responsibility of duty as Dr. King stated throughout this um, letter multiple times, we have a moral obligation um, to share what we know, what we've learned, what our experiences are, um, and to take a risk to be an ally, to stand up for what's right, to no longer be bystanders, um, but to, to take a stand and, and make sure that we are well aware of oppressions and that we are um, well equipped and empowered to overcome. So I think sharing stories and sharing education and knowledge uh, would be one of the most important ways. I want to piggyback off of those statements. 
I think one of the greatest things, and excuse my voice, is that as black Americans, we do not do a good job in conveying the history of our race to our offspring. I live in an integrated community, and all the Italians know their history. All the Jews know their history. But somehow we are ashamed of our history because we were brought here by slavery. I think what we really need to do is to focus on where we are going and how we're going to get there. And the real reason that Martin Luther King was in the jail in Birmingham, Alabama, was he was called by a friend to do something for the city of Birmingham. Until we realize how proud we are and who we are and make plans to move forward and not wait for people to give us what we need, then things will never change. I guess the, my proudest accomplishment in the civil rights movement was integrating the, the library, the Birmingham City Library. It's, it's a funny story, but it's, it, it's, it's one of my proudest moments. I was asked by Y.T. Walker, who was the, the chief strategist for Martin Luther King, if you know your history. He asked me to be the spokesperson for a group of students, and he wanted us to break, uh, to go from different directions and convert down to the library, the Birmingham City Library. I was afraid, even though I was a veteran, and I had been through many struggles in, in the Army, where as people called us, communists if, if we were members of the NAACP. I led a rebellion there, so we walked out of the meeting the blacks and saying, we are members of the NAACP. We weren't members, but it wasn't fair for us to be drafted into the service. I won't go into this I, me thing. But on that day, I was to be the spokesman as I approached the park between the courthouse and city hall. There were several white guys there with jackets on. Y.T. Walker told me that we were going to synchronize our, watch, our watches and converge on the, the Birmingham City Library. And he wanted me to be the spokesperson. As I approached, these guys were taking these things from under their coat. And this is a very critical time. We had the 16th Street bombing and what have you. As I walked in, the students started coming in, black students. And they took seats all over the library. And the white kids were saying, oh, the monkeys are here, and they'll stink, and what have you. 
And I told the, the librarian that we wanted to join the library. And she said, well, you have libraries in your neighborhood. Well, we said, but this is a library, I said, this is a library that we can all be a member of. We pay our taxes, and there is no such thing as black taxes and white taxes, but we are entitled to this library. <coughs> As the students came in, <laughs> the problem then was, how do we get out of here? Because <laughs> the kids were going out, oh, it stinks in here, and we're going to get you. After a while, and the TV cameras were running and what have you, then it was time to go out and face the mob. Fortunately, nothing happened except the next day, the Birmingham News denounced that going forward, that the Birmingham Library would be in it. There were a lot of years. There were selected buying campaigns where we would put on our mouth college jackets and sweaters and go downtown and force blacks to not shop. I remember one of the funniest incidents was we were on the escalator going up in Lovelands and uh, a couple of overweight black women were coming down and as we passed we would give them this mean look because they knew that they shouldn't be shopping and one of them said, we are shoplifters. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> but it's not funny. The struggle continues. And to see my son more than just being an instructor here, but to see so many of you here to try to better yourselves and elevate yourselves, is a, a real plus, and we must continue. The struggle goes on. We, there aren't any, there's no time to sit and celebrate. There's much to do. Mr. Robertson and I, I don't know who was first, but I, he was involved in automobile sales. I beat you by one more. <laughs> but I was there, we came back, we organized the Vulcan Kiwanis Club. There, but there's much to be done. <clears throat> and we are not there yet. But more than anything else, I have reached my son. And at last he tells me that he's proud of what happened. And he's proud to be my son. And I'm proud to be his father. And again, Thanks so much for inviting me, and thank you for being the young man that you are. You're trying to make me cry on program, but okay. <laughs> thank you so much. We now we have a selection by Keith Middleton, who will read a passage. Another one of Lawson State's fine students. You may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, and so forth? Is a negotiation a better path? You are quite right in calling for negotiation. <clears throat> Indeed, this is the very purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks to so dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. My sighting, the creation of tension as part of the work of the nonviolent resistor may sound rather shocking, but I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed violent tension, but there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension which is necessary for growth. Just as Socrates felt that it was very necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bunches of myths and have truth to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal. We must see the need for nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society 
that will help men rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. by Pierre Crawford. <laughs> we know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressed. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was well-timed. In the view of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation, for years now I heard the word wait. It rains in the air of Negro with appears of familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see but one of our distinguished jewelry that just too long delayed and just denied. It's an interesting concept when people tell you, wait, not now, it's not the time for that. And I think oftentimes that is meant to just put people off. Um, not now probably means I don't want to deal with it or I really don't have any plans for this to take place. In the civil rights movement, a lot of people probably thought it wasn't the time for that. We can look at the election of Barack Obama, a lot of people said it wasn't the time for that. There will oftentimes be crossroads in our life where people say, it's too early, it's too soon. But sometimes if we have the conviction and we have the determination, we have to move ahead. Let's look at the question here. In the passage, Dr. King is speaking about the Children's Crusade in which many young people in Birmingham bypass school and many times the wishes of their families to march in the streets of Birmingham to protest segregation. Panelists, 50 years later, do you think African Americans, especially Birmingham African American youth, could ever have the same drive to cause nonviolent tension to what they feel is an injustice? Do we still have the fight in us today that once existed among the youth? I'm going to take that question before Shirley gets the mic. <laughs> <laughs> My son is at City Hall, but I'm going to bring him next time. <laughs> We are proud fathers when you have good sons, it makes you proud. My sister, Benita, was in Birmingham, Alabama, doing the crusade. And she was there because my mother had three kids. I was the oldest, my son, my brother, Jay, Lawrence, and my sister, Benita. I was always rebellious and did not obey. I paid for it, but I did not obey. <laughs> so my sister asked mom and dad, can she participate in the march? And my dad said yes, and my mother said yes, you and your brother can go, but your other brother gonna stay here with me. <laughs> so my baby brother did not participate, so he's not in any history books or anything. I had the fortune of living across the street from Bethel Baptist Church and the incident that happened in Boston yesterday brought reflex back to me when I experienced 18 sticks of dynamite going off at the head of my pastor on Christmas night in 1956. Times were hard in Birmingham, Alabama, and you were not free. You don't know what it is to live in an open society like you are now. If we were back in the 50s, you could not be sitting here. You would probably be standing, and the white folks would be down front. You could not go to McDonald's if there was a McDonald's and walk in and eat. You had to stand at the window at the back and let them pass food to you. When it came to public transportation, there was a green board on the bus. If you sat in front of the bus, you were going to be arrested because the Jim Crow laws in the state of Alabama indicated that you were breaking the law. So I took on the leading role in Huntsville, Alabama and integrated for the first time showing this big boy, the first place to be integrated in Huntsville, Alabama. It was a very awkward thing because as a young black boy, mentally I was enslaved and approved of segregation. 
because that is how we were taught. We were taught that when we go buy clothes, you couldn't try them on. You just get them off the rack. If they don't fit, you take them back and you wear them. You could not go to the restroom. You could not go to Kitty Land Park. We were living based on ourselves, shackled within our minds, because we were colored. We went from color to Negro, from Negro to black, from black to African American. Now we're Afro American, and now we're back to black again. So we have many nomenclatures, but the most important one, I think, if you decide to move forward, this generation can do it. The only thing I'm worried about is that you don't understand whose shoulders you're standing on and the sacrifices that happen when people were beaten unnecessarily. You're not standing on your own shoulders. You're not standing on your own ground. You're standing on the shoulders of your forefathers who were called nigger and Uncle Charlie and never called anything that was perfect for his age. I remember when we walked in and shown this big boy on a Friday night. It was full of whites. I had on my green leather jacket. I was clean because I knew <laughs> we had called the newspaper and told them what we were going to do. And so I had on my clean leather jacket. My shoes were shining. And four of us walked in and shown this big boy. When we walked in the front door, the entire restaurant became silent. I could feel my hair tightening up because I didn't know if I would come out of there alive. So one white guy said, you get the feathers, I'll get the tar, and we'll get these niggas out of here. I turned around and looked at him like I was going to do something, but I was ready to run if I had to. So the manager came over to us, and I said, sir, we're here to eat. We're dressed properly. We have money. We want to eat. He said, I'm from New York, and I understand that, but you just cannot do it. So we told him we were not going to leave. And the goal was to get the news media. So he called the police. By the time he called the police, we knew it would take them about eight minutes to get there. Six minutes, we were gone <laughs> to Snow White and did the same thing. And we brought everybody off the campus at Alabama A&M University, Oakwood College, and we sat in. I saw cases where they made the people cleaning the counters throw water on the students who were sitting in to keep his job. We have endured to make things better for you. I am proud of you, but be aware that you didn't do it by yourself. Make sure you understand your history and be able to say, we can do it. I am extremely proud of the movie that's out now, Jackie Robinson. If you haven't seen it, you need to see it. It gives a capsulated report on how we suffer to get where we are now. Be thankful you are living in this generation. Be thankful that you have the type of facility that you have because if it were not for Martin Luther, Reverend Shuttlesworth, your parents, and other people, you would still be in slavery and psychologically you would still be living in segregation. ways we still are segregated in our minds and I think that um, one of the responsibilities that we have we keep going back one common thread the three of us to education to passing forward the story so that we can understand and appreciate where we're coming from and what we're dealing with when I first told my father I was going to go into education I got a two-hour lecture of how disappointed he was in me that he did not invest time, money, resources in me so that I could become a civil servant. He said that I was greater than education and he was disappointed in me. My father was, at the time, uh, the assistant attorney general for the state of Missouri. When I was growing up, he was the attorney for the NAACP in St. Louis, Missouri. And he was responsible for desegregating St. Louis County schools. It was in the 80s. My brother and I were among the first class to actually integrate some of the county schools, which is sad, given that you guys were fighting in the 50s and the 60s 
and here we are 20 years later, still fighting the fight. None of that meant anything to me at the time. Um, my father put me in a lot of civic organizations. I was in whatever youth groups the NAACP had, the Urban League. Um, once I got into my suburban school district, um, I was a part of a voluntary desegregation busing program, which was very controversial in St. Louis. Um, I was a part of a variety of race relations committees to try to keep down the violence and the issues that we were having, um, coming together, being forced together in that time. But it wasn't until I was working at Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery, Alabama. It was the 40th anniversary, I believe, of the King I Have a Dream speech. And we were working on our magazine, Teaching Tolerance. And I was in charge of writing the perspective piece, the introduction to the magazine. And as I sat there and started writing, I'm looking outside of an entire glass wall Dexter Avenue Baptist Church is right at our foot. The Capitol, right to my right. And that became the introduction to that essay, is that here I am 40 years later, finishing the job that my father started. I called my father and I read to him what I had started writing, and we both sat there and cried. I could hear him over the telephone, I know he could hear me. 40 years had passed. And my father, at that time, we talk about pride in children. I knew my father was proud of me. I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. I was always a good kid. But it was in that moment that I could hear the light bulb turn on for him, that I was doing what he raised me to do. I wasn't doing it in the courtroom, as he had hoped, but I was doing it in the classroom, which was equally as important, because I was reaching hundreds if not thousands of people who come through my classes each year and passing forth a message that they can then take out into the street. But I think that we have um, kind of missed the mark. You talked about um, whether or not Birmingham children, and it's just not Birmingham, children in general. Are you all young people? Are you ready? Could you take over and do the same thing that we saw the teens, young people do in the 60s and the 70s? And in thinking about this time, or this word, wait, we say wait, but we say it in a non-meaningful sort of way. We say wait as a way to just get you to get out of our way for a moment, but oftentimes it isn't significant, and I think that's the problem. We're not raising youth in the same way to be appreciative, to be respectful, um, to acknowledge the struggle. I know for me, I'm doing the same thing for my children, what my father did for us, and that is they are civic and community responsible citizens. My daughter is a member of Peace Birmingham. It's a coalition for Jewish and African American youth to understand and appreciate one another's struggles. Um, she participates in Birmingham Civil Rights Institute youth programs. Anything that I can find that I can do to get them out into the community to volunteer, they spent eight hours with my husband and I, and as we talk about pride, Calvin Briggs, yes, that's my husband, I'm proud of him. Um, but as we talk about pride and understanding, my kids spent eight hours in the hot sun on Saturday volunteering. That sense of purpose, that sense of commitment to the community, that sense of getting out of your own head, getting out of your own selfish desires and giving, I think that would put us in the spirit of empathy and understanding um, and, and being an advocate for ourselves as well as an advocate for others. And I think in that way, we could um, maybe perhaps be ready for a fight if a fight came along. Because I do think we have struggles right now. Um, there are a variety of struggles that our kids are facing, whether they know it or not. But, I mean, we're giving them video games, we're giving them television, we're giving them cable. You know, we live in a, uh, what is it called, the microwave generation where they expect everything right now, immediate gratification. There is no wait. Our kids don't have to wait because we're giving them everything. My children, they have to earn everything. For those of you who know my husband, I'm sure you can appreciate that. That attitude that he gives y'all every day in the classroom, mm -hmm. imagine being his kid. <laughs> we don't play. We love them. 
we're, we're nurturing, we're soft, we're cuddly, we kiss, we hug, we do all those great things. But they know that we're not playing with them. They know what's expected of them. They know that they're going to give in the community. They know that they're going to get up and go to church and give there. They know that they're expected to do certain things in the classroom. They have expectations, and I think that's what we're missing. You know, back in the day, there were less distractions. There were less things that, you know, got in the way. We respected our elders. You, the church was the helm. You know, I, I'm not even going to get in there about today's churches, but we have issues in our community. So I think getting back to our roots, getting this education, being reminded, um, being familiar with the struggle, and getting it out of our head, this whole post-racial thing. We're not post anything. It's awesome that Obama is there. I voted for him, love him to death, support him 100%, but it ain't over. My daughter is the only black golfer playing in high school golf right now. She was told by her coaches the first day after they allowed her on the team because her score was worthy of getting on that team. 2012, August, and they told my child, but don't expect to play. Don't expect to play. When my daughter goes to her home course, Hoover Country Club, the only other people who look like her are the people serving. There is one black member of Hoover Country Club. When my daughter turned in her scorecards over the winter break, her coaches said that they did not count because she played on the Robert Trent Jones public course. That it only counts if she played on the country club's course and they apologized that her parents did not get her a membership to the club. My husband and I try to pull her countless times and she keeps saying, mm-mm, nope. We forget that we put that fight in her. Yeah. Because when we see our child coming home in tears, it crushes us and we want to just pull back and stop. So the fight's not over. It looks different, but it's very much alive. So as we ask, what would you fight for today? Not much, most of you, because you're too caught up in yourself. You have to be able to get out of yourself in order to be willing to fight a fight. Selection written by Lashonda Smith. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past three years I have been gravely disappointed with the white model. I have almost reached a regrettable conclusion that Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizens' council or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, <clears throat> who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with the, your methods of direct action, who paternalistically, paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of good will is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright reject rejection. I had hoped that white moderate would understand that the law and order exist for the purpose of establishing justice and that when they fan in this purpose, they become the dangerously constructed dams that block the flow of social progress. I had hoped that the white moderate would understand that the present tension in the South is the necessary phase of the transition from an obnoxious negative peace, in which the Negro passively accepted his unjust plight to a substantive and positive peace in which all men will respect the dignity and worth of human personality. So much, Ms. Smith. We now have the last speech led by Mr. Ricky Parker, Jr.
Actually, we who engage in nonviolent direct actions are not to create us attention. We merely bring to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. We bring it out in the open, where it can be seen and dealt with, like a boil that can never be cured so long as it is covered up.